Good morning. Can you hear me all right? Well, that's a worry. Okay. Happy Easter. And, and um, are you going to collect eggs on Sunday? <laughs> um, when when do you think in the year that um, Christ was crucified? What month? April? Does that sound about right? So we, I think, I think they just picked this arbitrary time of the year. But when you look at it in our culture, it's another excuse for a camping trip. It's another long weekend to visit rallies. And as next door, they had their kids home, and it was another excuse for party. Um, I don't think there was much to do with Christ. Christ was tortured and died on Friday. He rested on Sabbath, and he left the tomb on Sunday. What was his crime? He challenged the ruling power and structure at the time. He did not conform with the hierarchy. Are we as Christians, as Seventh-day Adventists, facing a similar conflict with our government leaders as we approach the Sunday law? So much has happened in <clears throat> this last 10 years that is very different than we've experienced, certainly in the medical field where a particular strategy or procedure is being made mandatory well and truly of its testing period. And in Queensland, a nurse friend was telling me that the hospitals are now allowing nurses that elected through their conscience not to get the vax to come back. There's only one problem. They've all been charged with a criminal offense because they didn't comply. And so now it's a catch-22. Yes, you can come back to work, but no one's going to employ you with a criminal record. I would like you to turn with me to Luke 24. This is just a little prelim because I think some people thought I might do an Easter program, but this is just a prelim. Luke 24, 1 to 12. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men, in clothes that gleamed like lightning, stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men to be crucified and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe. The women, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. It would be a very hard thing for the people at the time to understand just what had happened, even though Christ had alluded to that. 
And in verse 50, It says, I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until have you been clothed with power on high. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they stayed continually at the temple praising God. So... Imagine those two things. I mean, they're at that time, you know, it must have been absolutely unbelievable. They had no forklifts, no cranes, no little backhoes to move that stone, but it moved. And then they're not into helicopters and remote things that go up in the sky and take cameras like drones, but all of a sudden they see a human rising up into the sky. Can you imagine them coming home and saying, guess what? Now, just before I move on, I'll tell you a little anecdote about Easter. Sometimes as parents, we put a little bit of heavy on our children. Some people think it's blackmail, but it's just a reminder they should be good. So my daughter's down for the weekend, and she said to her little three-year-old boy, I'm wanting you to be really good because I may have to phone and talk to the Easter Bunny. Now, this is a very bright boy. He turned around and he said, but Mom, the Easter Bunny doesn't talk. <laughs> he said something else. That's, you know what they say out of the mouths of babes? Okay. Now we'll have a prayer before we talk about the question, how can one know the true church? Dear Jesus, thank you for this opportunity to come before this congregation, our lovely little church. We pray for those people who are absent today that um, find it difficult to attend the sermons but attend the Sabbath school. We pray for those, Lord, that are at home suffering maybe a physical symptom or pain or just discouraged. We pray, Lord, for those that are not well, bless them, bring them back into the fold, we ask. May the Holy Spirit be in our midst and bless us this morning as we open your word. Amen. Okay. Let's have a look at this theme. We'll do the next one then. There are more than 200 denominations in the United States alone. I think there would be similar numbers in Australia. Most of these are nominally Christian, varying in beliefs from left to right, from extreme liberal to extreme conservative. Do you understand the distinction? I'll never forget as a new Christian when we were in Kempsey, when David Price was there, in 86, we moved from South Australia to Kempsey, and one of the elders came and sat beside Linda Nice and, and said, which side are you on? And I said, well, this week we'll sit on this side, thank you. I wasn't going to buy, I told them, you know, I, I don't do politics. Interestingly, each group believes that it's the chief, if not exclusive, repository of truth and therefore has a duty under God to continue its separate identity and witness to God. How many times have we heard that? The church, we have the truth. But the Bible informs us the time will come when good people everywhere will detach themselves from the present church. We'll do one more. There we go. I wasn't sure of your cues, Linda. I have to synchronize. Look, no hands, no clickers. Da da, it's magic. And identify themselves with the body that most closely confirms to God's ideals in this present world. So we've heard of that, haven't we? That there are good people in many different churches, and a time will come 
when they will come out. As it says in Revelations 18, 4 and 5, come out of her, my people. So let's go on to something we don't often talk about because we don't seem to uh, have an opportunity to do it. Some of you may know each other's journey because you've been together for a while, like Norman Rose, you know Kay and John, and a few other people have a few connections. But how did you come into the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Did you grow up in the church and therefore assume that it's good enough for the old folks, it's good enough for me? Or had you attended a church and you were disappointed in previous church experiences? We attended a friend's church one time at, out of Kempsey at Fredericton, and I was really taken back when in the middle of the program people started to drop down to the floor. Now, some people think we're odd that we drop down to the floor to pray, but these people were just dropping to the floor. Do you know why that was? Ian, why? Yeah. Sometimes we come to church because we have an invitation from a friend. It says, come, you'll get a kick out of the program. Come for big lunch. Sometimes people come as a result of a seminar, a Bible study, or evangelistic program that maybe one of the ministers run. Sometimes people come because they've experienced a crisis in their life, and they're thinking, well, I've tried everything else, so I might as well try faith. Some people are still indecisive. They have one foot in and one foot out, and they're still exploring, and they're still undecided. Next one, please. I'll just talk briefly about our own personal experience. Linda grew up in a Seventh-day Adventist church. Her parents separated when they were young, and that caused a lot of trauma. Um, and her father remarried a dragon lady, and that didn't help much. And um, then I came along, and I probably wasn't good enough because I wasn't going to Loma Linda. I was driving trucks at the time, and I was thinking that was a pretty big achievement, let alone going to the States. Canadians don't go to the States. Um, that's a no-no. Then we had a rude awakening while living in Darwin. Linda had premonitions for quite a period of time about the end of the world. And then at the same time, as often happened, kids are very subtle when they came home from school and said, quite bluntly, who's this bloke Jesus? And we realized we'd been, we hadn't done what we'd experienced at our home. We hadn't talked about Christ. And as it turned out, we began to meet with several congregations, different church groups. Um, some of them came across like, used car salesman that they set it up that you had to answer in a certain way and then that led you, well, you must become a member of the church. We looked at Roman Catholics, the Mormons, Latter-day Saints, you name it. Um, and in the end, we met a lovely pastor who was the right pastor at the right time, Pastor Graham Olson, and he was an ex-detective from South Australia, and he and I had worked similar sides of the street, and he was a big bloke that rode a motorbike, and he was non-judgmental, and he came and spent some time talking to our children, which was interesting because many of them didn't want the kids around. And he was the right man. He put no pressure. He said, um, come to the church and listen to the music. And it just went from there. I guess from me, my point of view is, um, having gone through the health side of things, I was impressed with the SDA church because I thought, here's a group that put their money where their mouth is. They sponsor missionary outreach. They have health messages. They have many medical 
boats on almost every major river in the world. They have beautiful hospitals and they have their own educational training. So that's a comprehensive one rather than the sort of hype that you get in the evangelistic programs that you see, which you know go to support their ministry and that's the end of it. They drive Rolls Royce and carry on like Looney Tunes and they do it all in the name of Christ. Okay, next one. If you're searching for the true church, how should you go about it? Go for the wealthier denominations. In this area, that means Roman Catholic Church. Get in there. One that's close to home and has good parking access. That's important. The church structure. Look at this beautiful church structure. You see all the stained glass windows and the beautiful golden, beautiful golden doorknobs. You go for a large congregation because large means they've got something going, or do you go for the more intimate one because you don't like crowds? Do you go for the influential aspect of the minister and the elders? I've heard people say, I don't go to that church anymore because I don't like the way the minister dresses. He's got old-fashioned suits. Well, I guess that'll keep him out of heaven. Pleasant choir. <laughs> They're out for break. And people your age. See, did you see the sign out here? This is a no-child zone. You know they have cruises now where they don't let you bring your children? So you get all the oldies together and they talk to each other and with their dementia. It's great, isn't it? I spoke to my sister yesterday and we asked her how mom's going at 97. She's in a care facility that happens to be in an area that's predominantly Chinese because they've taken over a lot of Vancouver. My mother knows no Chinese. Before she had dementia, she was fairly racist. My sister says she's sitting down speaking to a man who only knows Cantonese and they're having a lovely dialogue. <laughs> now, how is that for a blessing? I hear what you say, brother. <laughs> or should we look at your Bible to be a lamp to your feet? Will, you search, will your search lead you to a church? And these are the criteria. There's about six. Do you think he can handle six? Because I could do 12. Number one, radiates the love of God. In 1 John 4, 11, it says, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Any church group that is critical, self-absorbed, sensorious and legalistic could not be the true church. Have you ever been in a church like that? Thank you, Norm. But Norm came out of it. If the church members do not manifest love, it is no more than a noisy gong or a changing symbol, a clanging symbol. Let's have a look at 1 Corinthians 13. How many times have we said, it's not the sermon that we hear, but it's the attitude. We can talk about love or we can actually demonstrate it. 1 Corinthians 13. That's, that's the... In the Bible, that's the chapter on love. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. 
If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. Is that sobering? You see, we can get caught up in all the traditions, you know, where we sit, how many hymns we have, all sorts of things. Today I noticed very clearly the saxophone. Do you know why? It was right in my ear. And it was so nice she played in tune. Number two criteria, it will exalt Jesus Christ as the Son of God. I'm really happy that we had this to put on our wall to remind us why we come here to worship. Neither is there salvation in any other, says Peter, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Of course, that doesn't agree with some churches that say we have to pray to Mary or to the, 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 the pastor that leads out or the Pope. Unless... A church exalts Jesus Christ as the Son of God and confesses his divinity before men. It is not and cannot be the true church. Could I ask someone with a nice voice to read Matthew 10, 32 and 33? Someone with a Bible, preferably. Don't be shy. We're all friends here. Thank you, Karen. Okay. That's pretty clear, isn't it? We're uplifting God. Number three, the true church will honor the Bible as the word of God. I've been in churches where the pastor didn't open a Bible. And um, because the message that he had had nothing to do with the scripture. What does the scripture tell us about the word of God? If you can read that, it says, in his second letter to Timothy, the Apostle Paul says, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training and righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And Paul advises the Romans in Romans 15, 4, for whatever was written, in former days was written for our instruction that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. And my dear wife, every night before I get a hug, reads a chapter or two of the Bible. And what did you say, dear, about reading it the second time through? So should we just rely on our minister's sermon or our audio-visual programs? Should that really be the emphasis or should that be complementary? Number four, it will regard the Ten Commandments as the holy law of God. Have you heard that the Ten Commandments have been done away with? So now what we've got, one commandment. Look after number one, and you'll be right. Life is short, so make the most of it. As long as you don't hurt someone, anything is okay. The Apostle John states that if we keep his commandments, then we can be sure we know him. How can you know somebody 
if you don't study. Now, if you have an interest in cars like I admit I do, I get confused when people are asked, what sort of car was it? Well, it, it was a big one, and, and it was blue. Now, that doesn't help the police. We need to get the model and the year, right? And you need to know the car that you're running. I often ask people, why did you buy a Mazda C5 rather than a Skoda? And most people do some research before they buy a vehicle. But a majority of people buy a car by what the salesman says and the color. So if you go with that, then you don't need to understand the Ten Commandments. You just go with whatever someone says. Was Jesus a good role model while living around Jerusalem? You think he was? Does it ever talk about his ability as a carpenter? Was he shoddy or was he fair dinkum? Doesn't say much about it, does it? Other than he followed in his father. But my guess is with his character, he wouldn't be caught saying, oh, well, close enough is good enough. She'll be right. How did Jesus walk? Unquestionably in the ways of the Ten Commandments. I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. John 15, 10. Sometimes it's hard to keep all of the Ten Commandments, but we can't do it on our own. And then we look at what Jesus did. He preached the word in the synagogues. Not only that, he taught in the countryside and the cities where he traveled. In other words, wherever he went, he was communicating the love of Christ. Jesus stated in Revelations 14, 12, in the last days of earth history, here are they that keep the commandments of God. So we've got something that we need to hold on to, especially when things get difficult, because we can't rely on the things that we used to rely on. Number five, it's a good thing they did away with this one in the Ten Commandments, isn't it? How many times have you heard, it doesn't really matter which day you worship, as long as you worship, but that's not what God said. Observance of the seventh day is in fact an outstanding sign of the true church. It is a sign, God says, between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. Do you notice that he says throughout your generations, not up until the Pope decides to change the rules? When I worked in the health system for 25 years, it used to amaze me how executives in the system who probably wouldn't know a client from a bar of soap would keep changing the goalposts. And that used to make me really frustrated. And yet they could do it because they could do it. So the true Sabbath is not only a memorial of creation but also of sanctification. It was designed to remind people, God's people, of his power to create and redeem. Number six, it will portray a belief in the second coming. There's a member of this church that has a unique license plate. Do you know who it is? And it says Advent. And people pull them up all the time at the corner and say, what are you selling, brother? What's your company? Advent what? This church will be zealous for good deeds, will look with longing for the fulfillment of the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, that's about hope. It will cherish the Master's promise. If I go, you want to read it? Let's look at John 14. 
John 14. John 14, 1 and 3. Jesus comforts his disciples. Do not let your heart be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Does that sound like a promise? Well, I mean, it's interesting. Why would you go to prepare a place and then not bother to invite the guests? And we see in Luke 21, let's go back a few pages. Luke 21, 25 to 28. And is there someone in the back row that might read Luke 21, 25 to 28? Well, there's so many perplexities when you think about it. For those of you who were bending down and missed it when God gave out intelligence, aren't you happy that we now have artificial intelligence? So you don't have to think anymore, just plug it in. Oh, by the way, it's called Google. Can you imagine going to university and not having a Google? Do you know what I used to do? I had to go to the library. Do you know what a library is? It's a huge building, about four stories high, with different level of books and periodicals. And a student, bless their hearts, had to actually go and find the stuff. No Google. No spell check. Just kidney. There are six further characteristics of a true church. And if I was going to do a marathon sermon and put you all to sleep, I would run through them in detail. But these are just in case we get a chance to explore it at a later date. A true church will practice the biblical method of baptism. It will celebrate the Lord's Supper in simplicity. It will possess the gifts of the Spirit so that everyone is enriched in the church. It will appear modest in appearance, gentle in spirit, no conflict, no divisions. It will be clean living, upright and noble, eager to help in all good works. It will have a world outreach mission, health missionaries and educational institutions. And closing, next one. What is our motive to go and attend church? We go to the temple in a spirit of submission, not to get a blessing, so much as to give and be one. Going back in time, you know how change, the church changes. There was a time when we had a lot of social commitments. And I'll never forget one person who was a professional in Lorton area, but he was very arrogant. And he said, I don't think I'll be coming back. You're not entertaining enough. I felt like saying, well, if you think this isn't entertaining, hang around a bit. Wait till we get down to numbers. Congregational worship brings unity. It nurtures love amongst God's people and it shapes our identity worldwide. It's quite amazing when you look 
outside of Camden Haven just to see what our church is doing. And for those fortunate enough to attend Big Camp, you'll probably be inspired. And the last one is what Easter is about. We'll just have a prayer and thank God and the Holy Spirit for being with us as we understand this message. Thank you, dear God, that um, I'm able to come and join with the church and share a message from your word. Thank you, Lord, that in so many ways our church fulfills the criteria for a true church. We're not perfect, but then God didn't come to rescue perfect people. He came to deal with sinners at all levels. And it's just our prayer, Lord, that as we study and as we worship, we can develop more fully the character of Christ and be less self-focused. We ask that you bless each head and the family that they represent this morning. Thank you, Lord, for loving us and being our Heavenly Father. Amen.